All right. Kicking it off, everybody. Hello and welcome to today's webinar, District Energy Modeling Roundtable, presented by the IBIPSA USA Wisconsin Chapter. Today's session will be recorded and available through the IBIPSA USA YouTube channel. If you have any issues hearing the presentation, uh, please try calling in by phone instead of using the computer audio. This is a Zoom webinar, it's a special kind of Zoom. So you will be muted and if you're an attendee, you'll be off camera during the session, but please, please feel free to put questions in the Q and A. Uh, we're actually gonna have a specific, uh, pretty significant question and answer session with all the attend with all the panelists and attendees so you can just fire away your questions and I will be trying to sort through them once we get to that discussion session. Um, if you are adding a question, you have two options. You can either have everyone see it or just the presenters. Doesn't matter to me. Please feel free to share however you'd like. There's a little button you have to press to get that to change who receives stuff. Okay, uh, next slide. Bob. So just so you know, obviously this is online, but the group that put this together is the Wisconsin chapter of IBIPSA USA. So if you happen to be in Wisconsin, um, you know, or interested in attending our events in Wisconsin, please find us on LinkedIn. We have a group where we post stuff. We do about four events a year. We try not to uh, do too many, but um, each one we put a little, a little heart and soul into. So Thanks for joining. Uh, big shout out for this conference coming up, the SimBuild Conference, Denver, Colorado, next May. We'll read the slides a little bit. This is SimBuild 2024 marks the 20th anniversary of the first SimBuild Conference, which was in 2004. The theme of the conference is celebrating two decades of SimBuild uh, concept. SimBuild is the premier US venue for sharing cutting edge research in building performance simulation. The 2024 conference will include multiple formats of presentations to encourage discussions and exchange of ideas over the three days of the event. You can see some of the themes there. Look out in January if you would like to put together an oral presentation or uh, join a panel discussion. And there's the link right there to learn more. So please consider looking at SimBuild. Next slide. Okay, so this program today, I'm gonna spend almost no time on what a district energy system is. Then I'm gonna go through panelist introductions. We're gonna have a session where each panelist gives their thoughts on simulating district systems, just one at a time. And then we were gonna, we're gonna have a discussion session uh, where we take questions from each other between the panelists and also receive questions from folks online. So. And again, I'll keep reminding you, please share your questions on Zoom uh, if you would like to have them featured in the discussion. And then, uh, so quick motivation. So the, the group of us at the Wisconsin chapter really were noticing a lot of really interesting work bubbling up in district systems. And, you know, this is just, our personal experience, but we really were interested uh, to try and understand how these systems are being simulated out in the out in the industry. You know, um, it's something. It's not exactly a new concept, but um, it's it possibly it's growing. We think it's growing. Some of our panelists have seen growth, and uh, I wanted to show you a picture in case you're unfamiliar with district systems. We're not going to really do much explaining uh, uh, of the concept broadly, but just so you know, the idea is, you know, typically a whole bunch of buildings in the middle are being served. They're heating and cooling, and I guess possibly electricity needs from uh, from some central source. That's the big, broad idea. I think most of our panelists have spent more time just thinking about thermal energy uh, distribution rather than electricity grids. Uh, and that's mostly probably what we'll be talking about when we're simulating these systems. But uh, that's my quick, thousand foot if, if you're here for 
detailed introduction to what district energy systems are. I'm sorry, but hopefully you might still get some interesting information. So in alphabetical order, our panelists, we have an amazing group of panelists. Fred Betts has a PhD in building performance and diagnostics from Carnegie Mellon University. He is the founder and president of Betts Consult LLC. Founded in March, 2022, Betts Consult serves clients in the fields of decarbonization, energy and water efficiency, energy and ventilation code compliance, products research, standards development and data analysis. Fred is a mechanical engineer and building performance consultant with 14 years of experience. Fred is also an instructor at, of energy efficiency in buildings at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Fred sits on several committees for ASHRAE, ASHE, and the US EPA RAP. I don't even know what that is, Fred. You, you have to tell me offline. And is an active participant with ABIPSA USA, as well as having authored over 20 technical articles. Next up, David Bradley. David is a principal at Thermal Energy Systems Specialists in Madison, Wisconsin. He's also a member of our Wisconsin committee. The firm's first extended experience with district energy modeling came in 2012 with a project that aims to heat 50 homes in Alberta, Canada, entirely by means of a solar thermal system. Since then, district energy and campus central plants modeling have become mainstays uh, of their project work. Most recently, David has been working on an electrification project that seeks to move a large scale distillery and campus away from natural gas and towards renewables supplemented by both short and long-term thermal storage. Next up, Brendan. Brendan Huss is a mechanical engineer with 10 years of central utility plant experience for corporate, educational, and healthcare clients. While at HGA, Brendan has worked almost exclusively in the analysis and design of central boiler and chiller plants and district heating and cooling distribution systems. He has experience in life cycle cost analysis, energy optimization, and developing and commissioning central plant control sequences. Brendan is a member of the International District Energy Association. Next up, Nathan. Nathan Moore is a research software engineer developing UrbanOpt, among other tools, at the National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden, Colorado. He has a background in commercial property management, residential and commercial energy analyses, and software development. His all-electric house in Boulder is conditioned only by mini splits. Very cool. And he grew up in an off-grid house in the woods of Vermont. Oh, wow. When not building tools to decarbonize our world, he can be found with his wife and son mountain biking, snowboarding, and sailing. Next up, Mike Walters. Mike Walters, PE, is an industry leader in the comprehensive techno-economic analysis of energy systems and alternatives with a background in high-performance buildings, energy planning, and the design and construction of geothermal systems and central energy plants. His project achievements include Cornell University's standard setting climate action plan and the district energy transformation of the Ford Motor Company's Dearborn campus. Wow. Mike is an adjunct professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Civil Engineering. Whew. Thank you all for listening and please give a Warm welcome, virtual clap to our panel of experts. Okay, so what we're gonna do is each expert alphabetically, so Fred's first, to uh, should uh, please go through these questions. These are questions that are about simulating district energy systems and the questions we came up with that really thought to bring out the current state of the art and where the state of the art might need to move uh in in our tools so fred would you please uh kick it off you can everybody doesn't have to answer every question but uh yes. you know answer what you what you might be interested in sure thanks graham um so i'll try to hit all of these uh quickly um so i work with both existing and new systems and that is one of the first questions you need to answer when you're going to the next question of what tools to use uh, if you have an existing system and you have metered data uh, for it, um, 
the physics is embodied in that existing system data. And so, you know, you don't necessarily need to recreate that. And so you can often go to a simpler tool, uh, even a spreadsheet or the Nequest model for a district system, if, if need be. If you're doing a new system, um, again, depending on how com complex that system is, um, you know, the tools you use can can vary there again. And because in this case, you are creating the physics, right? And so if you're doing a ground source heat pump system, you want to have a, a model or models that that leverage that um, underground physics heat transfer. Because not that you can't recreate that, but doing that manually by hand is really extraordinarily difficult. Um, modeling practice, actually, I don't think it has changed much in the five, last five or 20 years. Um, in general, I see uh, people are, they're handed a problem, whatever that problem might be, and then they use the tools that they already know to try to solve that problem, which is a little dangerous at times, again, depending on what that is. Um, you know, you, you want to choose a tool to solve a problem, not a problem or a tool to, you know, um, has to fit to your problem, right? And so uh, that's, a, I think, a, a pretty big challenge going into the next five years as we have, you know, you know, ground source heat pump systems and thermal storage, especially large scale thermal storage and complex dispatching of equipment. Uh, the tools exist to do that, but a lot of them take more than a smile to use. And so the learning curve is pretty steep on those. And I think that's going to dissuade people. They're going to say, well, I just need to get an answer. Uh, and doesn't matter if the answer is really accurate or not. Um, so, so yeah, improving workflow. Um, again, knowing what you're trying to achieve, because there's lots of different goals that we can solve. Everything from just a code compliance, right? Uh, we've done district energy models for code compliance versus designing it for decarbonization and trying to be really accurate with how it's predicted and, and cost modeling and, and so on. Um, and approaching quality insurance model, model validation. It's kind of like approaching model validation for any other project. It's it's just, you know, go back, see what you can find after the fact. Uh, hopefully you do more than one of these um, or just, you know, read about what others have done and see, see how they really work. So hopefully that was quick enough. Thanks. Yeah, that was only two and a half minutes. So uh, uh, you did really very efficient, Fred. Everybody, we have like yeah, maybe four-ish minutes per. So um uh yeah we're doing well so next up would be uh david sir how you know i should actually read these questions out i i, I apologize what we're answering what problems are you trying to solve uh what tools do you use how has your practice changed in the last five years where do you see your practice going in the next five years um and then how how could your workflow improve so again, those are the questions. David, please, uh, please jump in, sir. Thanks, Ram. Um, so uh, I sort of sit at a crossroads in some ways between uh, developing software um, and using it. We work uh, almost exclusively with a software tool called Transus, um, and in, in my experience, sort of as a as as a as as a developer of 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 energy modeling software tools, there's a spectrum. And on the one end, when you when you sit down to write a model of something, you're gonna you, you, we're simplifying physical processes into something that we can manage mathematically. Um, and the more assumptions you build in as a developer, you have a decision to make how many assumptions, you know how much how much do I want to assume? And how much do I want to leave this on the user's shoulders? And on the one end, you can make a lot of assumptions and end up with a model that is very easy to implement, but perhaps lacks flexibility. And on the other end of the spectrum are tools where there's not a lot of assumptions built in and the user has to do an intensive amount of work in order to model something, but they have a great deal of flexibility. and. I think that in thinking about modeling tools, uh, all of the modeling tools that I that I have encountered have a well deserved and intentional place on that on that spectrum. So Transis is sort of out on the really flexible 
uh, but doesn't do a lot for you. There's a, it's one of the, as Fred was mentioning, it's one of the ones that's, that sort of requires a bit of a steep learning curve. So in a way over the past five years, district energy modeling has come to us um, and we've been asked and transits has been a pretty good tool um, for considering district energy models because there is a high degree of variability from one um, from one system to the next. And with a tool like transits, and I don't want to suggest that that transits is 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 alone in this, but uh, in the <clears throat> in the way that systems are conceptualized in some of these more flexible tools, uh, modeling uh, an electrical grid would not be um, any real really different from from modeling a a thermal grid whether that's a small scale campus a large scale campus or something in between but what we found is that there's a great deal of variability you know one campus that we dealt with had um some diesel engine generators uh on it there was a manufacturer of a diesel engine generator and and they wanted to use waste heat from those things to offset some of their boiler uh, needs and wanted to in, include some absorption chilling in their thermally driven absorption chilling in there as well. Um, so I, I think in a way, district energy modeling has sort of shown up on our doorstep uh, that was perhaps pretty well prepared to deal with a lot of the district energy models that people have conceived. Over the next five years though, um, you know, we've started to see um, an explosion, not only in the number of projects, but in some of the ideas that are coming out. For instance, uh, we were approached recently about a bore field where they wanted to drill conical bores in, uh, you know, a conical bore field, one that had a small footprint at the top and spread out at the bottom. Well, there's not... Uh, a ton of literature out there about how one goes about modeling that sort of thing. Then another one recently, imagine a coat hanger shaped bore field that is kind of goes down, slopes across, goes horizontally for a while and then comes back up again. And the whole thing is a kilometer and a half under the ground. So there's, I, I think in the next five years, um, there's, there's a, there's an explosion of thinking about districts and the the pace at which the um, the modeling is going to need th there's going to need to be a lot of fundamental research um, done, as well as implementation. I think another area of of um, that needs to that that we see evolving in the next five years is in controls. When you put a heat recovery chiller uh, in between a hot loop and a cold loop. That's all well and good, but there are 150,000 different ways that you could control that thing. And they're, they're, I think it, it would be really great to see um, in the next five years some some ways of characterizing that that is that is easier than the way we're doing it now. We've got the flexibility to do it now. It's just a matter of of the the time that is entailed in 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 making those changes. So I, I do see some equipment changes, more controls changes coming um, in in the next five years as well that would that would improve our ability to um, track down some of the great ideas that are that are uh, exploding into the field. That about sums up yeah. what I what I wanted to mention. Thank you, David. Excellent, excellent, excellent. All right, uh, next up please is uh, Brendan Huss. Brendan, please share your thoughts. Thanks, Graham. Um, I will start by saying uh, the problems I'm trying to solve. So we work with a you know, variety of clients who are you know, everything from trying to establish a brand new district system to uh, reconfiguring or replacing equipment in an existing system uh, to someone who may not want to add any new equipment at all, but instead is looking to 
optimize the equipment they have and make that equipment perform better. So I, I think kind of like Fred touched on, in each of these situations, you're likely going to take a different approach. Um, however, I'll also say that um, we typically rely pretty heavily on spreadsheets in Excel. Um, and we have we have a lot of good experience in doing that. And um, we've found that you kind of have ultimate control over inputs and outputs and uh, tweaking every variable um, when we're using a spreadsheet versus using sort of a canned software. Um, I will say though, you know, kind of like David was touching on, there are some situations, you know, especially as we get into very complicated geothermal systems where a spreadsheet is not, you know, we don't have that experience or knowledge to input that sort of system into a spreadsheet and, and try to model that with any relative accuracy. Um, but any sort of um, equipment or uh, performance of a system, we, could, we tend to be able to model that even if it is a, a new system, we can come up with pretty good approximations for that system just using spreadsheet calculations that have been developed over um, you know, the past decades. Um, how has our modeling practice changed in the last five years? So because we rely heavily on spreadsheets, it, it hasn't really changed. Although I will say that what changes tend, tends to be the problems that our clients are trying to, to solve for. Um, so in the past, a lot of what we've done has been um, optimizations where it's a, a low first cost effort uh, that aims to maybe make a few physical changes to a system, but let's make this system perform much, much better than it is currently. Um, and then where do I see things going? You know, very recently now, it seems everyone is trying to decarbonize. Everyone is trying to electrify. And with that comes uh, the insertion of heat recovery equipment into almost any system. And, um, you know, we find that uh, Kind of again, like like David was saying, these are incredibly complicated machines. Uh, you know, not only to program in the field. I've spent hours with uh, uh, with controls contractors trying to program this equipment to function as we intend it. So um, it isn't a surprise that trying to model it is equally as difficult, if not more difficult. So um, you know, I think uh, again, though, I I would say that we can control all of those variables. What are the, what's the leaving water temperature? What's the heating load? What's the cooling load? How are we balancing out that load across that heat recovery chiller? I find I have the best luck doing that if I can control that via a spreadsheet versus trying to, you know, use it as a black box in, in some, some other software. Um, and then where do I see my workflow improving? I, I do think that, um, supplementing spreadsheets with other softwares is a is a great way to you know come up with a load profile for a large swath of buildings using something like IESVE where you can model all these all these buildings very simply as sort of these block loads and come up with an hourly load profile from all of that dump that into a spreadsheet and now I can manipulate that as much as I as I want the other thing we're doing is is introducing you know other scripts, and you can make a spreadsheet very complicated with Python scripts, or um, you know, I'll even say AI, which I know is a very buzzy thing right now. But you know, you can kind of use AI to to develop these some data, and you give it a big data set, and it'll it'll spit out uh, you know curves and relationships that that again can then be input into my model, and um, I can then take that and run with it. I think that's all I wanted to cover at this point. Oh man, you you just you just uh, justified everyone's attendance. Someone said AI, <laughs> so my boss is Check happy now. I went to an AI talk. Sorry, I don't mean to pick on you. Uh, I just think that's wonderful, and it makes sense. I'm not trying to diminish it. It absolutely makes sense. Um, okay, thank you so much, Brendan. Uh, okay, next up in alphabetical is Nathan Moore. Nathan, please share. Thank you. I'll try to stay within the time limit. <clears throat> We're doing great on time. So we've got, I've got 10 minutes left just in this part. So you and Mike can Excellent. jabber for five minutes each. Thank you. So NREL is one of the US's national labs and we've developed a lot of the back engines that power a number of other tools. So we built 
Energy Plus and Open Studio, and and we're working on the the successor to that as well. And ooh, about a decade ago, we're looking at trying to increase the reach of these of these backend engines, uh, and found that yeah, there was a gap in in modeling larger scale that 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 was hard and people were using spreadsheets and transists. Uh, so NREL did an internally funded project that began as an internally funded project to try to figure out a way to do district scale modeling. And then that got picked up by several different offices in the Department of Energy. So we now have funding from uh, the Building Technology Office, the Geothermal Technology Office, and the Industrial Efficiency and Decarbonization Office. Um, so all three of those uh, offices are interested in, in this district energy system modeling. And that gets us to the UrbanOpt project now is developing open source modeling capabilities that can enable commercial software development companies and in industry practitioners um, for district and community scale stuff. So we are not building a end user tool. We're trying to build a backend engine that other software developers can put into their tool and use our physics-based, uh, you know, you get the, the might of the US government behind you to be able to, to provide uh, the highest quality results you can. So with these, I mean, we can use use Energy Plus and Open Studio to provide building loads and then pass that through this UrbanOpt project into district energy system modeling, uh, as well as UrbanOpt can provide a single interface with other district tools, like what you were talking about earlier with electricity grid stuff. Uh, we can simulate microgrids and distributed generation and um, load management in wires and uh, all of that for for electrical grids or districts as well as thermal grids. Uh, the problem to solve is a great question to for the end user because we feel like different tools are required. Um, you know, if you're if you're trying to ask, should we use a district energy system for this project? That's a very different type of question than how should we design a district system for this project? That's a much more detailed, bigger picture and will probably require a different tool. Um, <clears throat> The current UrbanOpt tool can take either our generated open studio loads or your, if you can provide hourly loads from measured data, great, and run that into a district system in Modelica. And you can simulate with Modelica all of the different components there and, and uh, do various generations. You can do a fourth generation district system for a central boiler or a fifth generation if you're doing uh, a bore field and ground source or waste heat recovery from some other um, heat source that you have. UrbanOpt is trying very hard to be modular and uh, let people use whichever part of it you want rather than all of it, necessarily needing all of it at the same time. Um, and let's see, how are we doing? Um, looking towards the future, as, as uh, Yogi Berra says, right? Predictions are hard, especially when they're about the future. <laughs> we, we certainly don't want to say X, Y, or Z is going to happen. We're, we're trying to be a little bit reactive um, to get input from industry practitioners and people who are actually designing district systems or software developers who are saying, this is the workflow that the tool needs to do, needs to provide. And we want to fit into that scheme. 
Okay, we're not we're not trying to provide a a tool for people. We're trying to provide a backend engine that has powerful physics and and design capabilities. <clears throat> So who knows what could come in the future? Uh, as David was saying, with all of these new new district systems being built, perhaps we will have more field data and validation can get better. That might be a thing in the next five years. Perhaps uh, the modeling will itself be better. I think district systems are complicated enough that they're always going to be some flavor of custom, and and it, there's always going to be a non-trivial amount of expert work required to figure out these systems. <clears throat> and we're trying to make a tool that can help people figure that out. Awesome. Thank you, Nathan. Okay, Mr. Walters, sir, please share your experience. Pretty interesting to listen to this group of uh, folks talk. And uh, we do all come uh, from different backgrounds and kind of different day-to-day -day activities, but confronting the same market. And it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty cool. I mean, I think I've, I've certainly worked with a few of the panelists on projects um, today, so they understood some of the per perspectives, but it's interesting to hear what's going on at NREL uh, kind of to, to try to drive the fundamental uh, aspects of modeling in the industry. And, um, you know, I, I come back to the, I'm more of a consumer on the energy modeling side of things than I am actually a developer of an energy model. Uh, and so I, you know, my perspective is kind of the old adage of, you know, all models are wrong, but some models are useful, right? And uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm all about a fast, useful model because basically on on district energy systems, right? They're big, complex, wicked problems. There is no single answer. There is, as as David mentioned, 150,000 ways to control something and seven million ways to design it, and it could have. You know, it could have these buildings in it or those buildings in it or all the buildings in it. it. You know, there's so many factors that that can vary widely that you, you know, I find that what we're doing on projects is helping clients and ourselves figure out what actually matters, what moves the dial on how we make a decision here and what do we need to spend more time on. You know, we talk a lot on our projects about the value of additional information and can a you know, to Brendan's point, can a spreadsheet model get us down the path quickly, right? So then we know, well, we want thermal storage and a ground source heat exchanger and heat pumps of a certain scale. And then we need to spend more time figuring out, well, what's the electrical grid connection capability on our site? And what is the financial model for this district energy proposition as opposed to the energy model for this proposition? And is there a financial solution here at all that is workable to make all of the engineering that we love to do, you know, valuable to the end users and, and the, you know, eventual client or developer or owner of those systems. And I think, you know, as, as I think back in the last maybe 10 years of, of work that, that I've done in the space, it's, it's moved more and more towards an integrated modeling effort that is as much about the energy modeling as it is about the financial model and the financial modeling. And so, you know, we, we have analysts that work on projects and do energy modeling using Excel, IES, um, Transis certainly, and, and some of the older, more basic tools, right? And then we have MBAs who work on the financial side of linking those two things together and trying to make a case for the decision that you that we all think is likely so that we can say, okay, it took us whatever, three, three months, six months, nine months to model those potential set of scenarios. We think scenario X is the, the viable path forward, but now we need to really spend a lot of time doing optimization and figuring out what kinds of technologies need to be added to, uh, you know, make the whole project work and quote unquote pencil out as opposed to just thermodynamically, is it a, is it a cool solution and, and, you know, does it work? I, I think that's the biggest thing we see is that we're getting to the point where the systems are so complicated. There's so many 
heat sources, heat sinks, technology applications to move energy from one portion of a system to another portion of a system that we've used transits more and more to, to help do that, even though we would love to stay in spreadsheets because we understand them easily as, you know, and our clients can understand what the inputs were, what the outputs were, who moved what factor. And, you know, you can see a highlighted yellow cell and say, okay, that's a three instead of a five now. So I understand what was changed in this model as opposed to me having to call David and get on a 45 minute conversation with a client and have them help, you know, understand Well, we're in this little area, the transit model up here. And I'm sorry, you're, you're, you're confused by that, but just stay with us for a minute. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing. And then trying to say, like, we spent years sometimes on a model, right, and a design process. And then we have a set of flow diagrams and an outcome and a control system that we all think is going to get implemented. And I think in the next five years, we're going to spend time taking that model, building it, putting it in operation, and then helping a client optimize that system th with the model that was developed originally, as opposed to hey, we, we made some decisions from this model, we're going to get a lead rating for your building, or, you know, those kinds of basic things that energy modeling once was tasked with, and it's much more complicated, and it's much more about outcomes, and making sure the outcomes we thought we wanted, even if we didn't predict them accurately, but the overall high-level outcomes, we're actually getting that outcome on projects, and you know, we've, we've seen that a lot in the higher ed space, in the in the sort of mixed use development space. And so I think we're we're more or less comfortable doing those kinds of technologies, those kinds of systems and those kinds of load profiles. But the industrial sector is really waking up to the, the opportunities here. And they're going to ask us to do more and more things that are complicated with modeling, not only the not only the HVAC systems in buildings or the central plant systems that supply the sort of development, but then the processes that are going on inside of these facilities, which are very intricate and very human factors based. And there's, it just gets, you know, it's another level of overall complexity to the whole thing. And that's, a, those are a lot of challenges to, to address, but, you know, I think, it's great to see a panel of people working on components that will have to integrate in order to help solve those systems. So I'll, I'll hang up, you know, my speech right there and then maybe get into a little bit of conversation with everybody. Oh man. So interesting, Mike. Thank you. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, sorry. I, I should just let everybody else talk. So, so here, here we have our, our sort of, uh, our, our, our time, we have basically the rest of this session, 25 to 30 minutes to discuss amongst ourselves. It's not necessarily super organized. I have a few things that I, I think would be interesting to bring up, but, uh, you know, to kind of, uh, respect the audience here, I'll, I'll go through some of these audience questions and, and, uh, oh, I need to switch the slide. Uh, oh, no, there we go. So yeah, everybody, if you have questions, uh, please, please jump in and, uh, and, and, and put them on the chat. Uh, oh, Alan just raised his hand. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Looks like Alan has a, a question for me in the, in the Q and A. Yeah. Uh, Alan, I just gave you permission to speak. So if you'd like to ask your question live, please go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, uh, you guys mentioned, um, um, uh, to Brandon, you mentioned spreadsheet analytics and then you, you guys use IES. I was just wondering if you guys ever compared um, like results from those two methodologies? Not directly. Um, I will say that, that um, I think it, you know, whether we're using IESVE or using spreadsheets, there's a couple of different factors. So one would be, is this a new system or an existing system? Um, I think, I guess, in either case, you could, it also then depends on uh, what is your end goal. And so from my perspective, I'm typically focused more on the central plant itself, and I'm not making any changes to the building systems. Uh, or at least not directly. And so in that case, a uh, spreadsheet approximation of, okay, what is the what is the load on this building? If it's a new building, I can approximate that either using some kind of square foot per ton metrics or whatever. 
uh, or I can try to make it a little more complicated. I could plug it into IES, get a rough shape of the building, determine what that load is. But now that's just a load on my central plant. And that's the end case for modeling that building. I think if your goal is let's model this district system and now what happens if we add better windows to all of the buildings in this district? Or what happens if we uh, add shading to, to the buildings or increase insulation or you know, do all sorts of th modifications to the buildings themselves? In that case, I think using an IESVE model where you can then simply go back, change each of these different characteristics on all these buildings, and now look at what's that collective impact on the central plant, that's where that might be a, a good use case for it. So I hate to say it, but the answer is it, it depends, you know, on, on which I might be using. Sorry, I guess my question was a little bit confusing. I was saying using IES for central plant modeling, not for downstream modeling. Uh, in IES, you can do schedule load and do heat pump central plants and um, set up controls without creating any, you know, downstream buildings. Uh, I guess that that was my question. Sure. That, yeah. Sorry. That's sorry. my fault. Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, in that case, I will say I've tried using IES for central plant modeling, but my uh, preference is still spreadsheets. And that is, it really, to me, comes down to sort of the controllability of the model. And I have ultimate control over my model when I can get the equipment curves for the chiller that I know is there from the manufacturer. I can develop those curves in my spreadsheet. And I know that those, and I know you can do that in, you can input that into IESVE as well, but then, and I know there's scheduling and I know you can do all of that. And I think I've just had much better luck doing that in a spreadsheet uh, and getting results that look reasonable to me than, than I've had uh, luck doing that in IESVE at this point. But if you're really good at IESVE, I think it's certainly you, you could probably come up with, uh, you know, just as good of results in, in that software. So I think it's a more of a comfort level than a, um, better results in one or the other. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Brendan. Thank you, Alan. So I'm uh, I'm keeping a can mental I, cue. Can I oh, add a point to what else? Brendan yeah, just, Fred, just said, um, is it, yeah. it's something that I'm working on in a project out on the West Coast right now where it's an existing central plant, an existing uh, a large hospital uh, tied to that central plant. And, you know, they're looking to electrify. Uh, they have, a, you know, two large steam boilers, a very, very traditional uh, existing facility. Um, but it is a good point that Brendan made up or, or made it is that um, using the building side, especially when we're talking about electrification, you know, a lot of people are taking the nameplate values of their boilers and saying, this is how much heat pump I need. And in reality, that nameplate and that actual load tend to never meet, right? And often when you're in existing, uh, working with an existing facility, um, there's lots of inefficiencies that can be um, implemented so for an example, for, again, for this facility where we have a limited footprint, right? And so I can't just put in heat pumps at the equivalent load. There's physically not enough space to do that, right? And so to be able to interact back and forth between your load side and your plant side has some real value in this. And if you do have it all in one uh, software package, that's quite handy, right? In that I can change my load profile or can, can do Brennan said, let's add better windows, right? In this case of this building, it's a bunch of single pane windows. It's from the 1960s, right? And it'll have a significant heat loss impact on this building. And that will actually change the load profile and quite literally reduce the number of heat pumps that I'm going to need, right? And so having, again, depending on what application you're doing, um, having a, a solution or software that can interact between the load side and, and, and the supply side, it can be really valuable because uh, again has those part of the performance curves and overall sizing and so on uh i could also add something to alan's original question uh yeah i've compared a whole bunch of softwares um spreadsheets um is uh transis energy plus equest trace 700 not trace 3d um they all again do different things better and worse than others uh, that's why I mentioned is like, you know, pick the tool that's right. And I know that's a generic answer right now because they're all good at different things. Um, they're all on a spectrum, right? And 
depending on what you're trying to achieve. Um, they, you know, again, it's inputs and inputs um, drive the results, right? The physics, they all capture the physics fairly well, but um, you just make sure that the inputs you're putting into your spreadsheet model match the inputs of your IESV model. You'll get pretty close within a couple of percent. There's some noise, but it should be pretty close. Thanks. Thanks, Fred. Um, so I've got a mental cue. I know Salam has his hand raised, but I'm going to go in order of questions answer asked. So uh, let's see, we've got 13 minutes left. So Victor uh, Bajewski, I'm going to guess. I don't even know if I got that right. Sorry, Victor. Had a couple of questions. One in the chat, has anyone used the Urbanoff based flows? Uh, I actually have. Uh, I am doing a very broad urban planning exercise and my client actually knew about urban oft and was really excited about the super clearly communicated electrical and thermal uh all-in-one workflow and so that was a reason that i went with it um has anyone else used the urban Opt tool set in the in the panel urban opt cool. is very um, much under development <laughs> Also, I happen to be really, uh, you know, all some of the tools that feed into UrbanOpt, all the open studio stuff just fit me. So that was kind of how I ended up there. But Victor has some more questions. Who has NREL partnered with or is looking to partner with for commercial commercial district software? Is that something you can comment on, Nathan? Sure, yeah. Um, I want to make one last comment on what Fred was and, uh <laughs> <laughs> what Brendan was saying earlier too, I think, is that if you ask a good professional a good question, invariably the answer will always boil down to it depends. <laughs> that is how you know you've asked a good question of a good professional. Um, all right. Uh, NREL has been working with a software developer called Ladybug Tools. Ladybug Tools builds plugins for Rhino, uh, and that that um, 3D modeling software. And through through Ladybug, UrbanOpt is becoming available as it gets developed. It's certainly not a polished sort of finished product at this point. We are we are still building it. It's it's growing as we speak, which certainly will provide frustrations if you are trying to use a tool that uses UrbanOpt and are expecting something that is competing with, with Trensys, something, you know, something that has been fully featured and around for a long time. But that also gives you the opportunity to have some input into this open source software that if if you have a particular use case or a workflow that your your business works in x y or z way this is still under development and we can take input <clears throat> so we are not exclusive with any software developer we're it's open source it can be used by anybody it's it's a back end engine and we have one ladybug that has already uh, started using it. Um, turns out one of the primary developers of ladybug is here in attendance at this meeting. <laughs> I could thank add, you. I could, um, oh, I, go ahead. I could add. I could add too that that to be to be perfectly honest, I'm a bit embarrassed to admit this. Um, until we had sort of a, a, a warm up call amongst the panelists to discuss the how we were going to present all this information, I wasn't aware that UrbanOpt existed. And um, I think one of the things that that would be fantastic to see arriving over the next five years is better interoperability between between softwares. I mean, UrbanOpt is a UrbanOpt is an engine. And I mean, there are two ways that one can interface with that sort of thing. I don't, I don't see. It, there will be people who develop interfaces and front ends for 
that engine. But then there's also um, a great deal of power in sort of engine to engine um, workflow. In other words, can you can you uh, work with a, a are there ways that you can work with, say, um, a, a, a transis project and pass it off to urban opt or an urban opt project and pass it off to transis not not in a not in a, a complete way but but uh i think this this sort of speaks to a necessity of of this kind of um of this kind of discussion to say hey th there's got to be efficiencies between between passing information about one model from one software to to the next. Um. Yeah. Thanks, David. Um, let's see, we've got like seven minutes left. If any of our panelists wanna answer directly in the Q&A, please go ahead. I'm worried we're not gonna get to all the questions. I'm willing to keep going, but after 12 o'clock, but if other people need to jump off, obviously please do that. Um, all right, Salam, I'm going to unmute you and please share your question. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hi. Uh, sorry, I, I came a bit late. Maybe I've missed, uh, maybe you've answered uh, my question already. Uh, again, I'm another fan of Urban Opt. I've, I've read a lot uh, about it. And I understand in the uh, development process. Um, I'll be very brief. Uh, I've already developed. I got an hourly uh, reading or uh, out of uh, Energy Plus, and I want to input it to Energy uh, to Urban Opt. Uh, is at this stage is it ready for thermal networks? If I want to design a thermal network with Urban Opt. Is that a completed part or still it's under development if I got an hourly data for the demand? I think the answer to that is yes. Uh, I don't know if- Okay, if, sorry uh, if I missed this. No, 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 no. It's a, I, I just having, having used Urban Up, um, maybe Nathan can comment specifically um, oh. Okay, the and if but, if the but, answer is, would that be through an Excel sheet as an input, or we need to use Modelica? Urban Ops inputs are either Modelica or JSON based, um, which is either either JSON files that the are generated from open studio models, or you can provide your own hourly loads in a Modelica file. Um, and then and then parts of UrbanOpt will generate a full Modelica model, which you can then run. Um, we're working on a system for uh, seamless running of the Modelica model as well, or if you have Dimola or Optimica or open Modelica, you can run it yourself as well. Awesome. Right. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a really interesting question. Next one in the queue. Uh, how much are you all seeing is the dynamic nature of the loads at the district level? Is that really important to your big picture design? You know, like if, for instance, Amir says the power of Modelica is you can really get in the weeds with really specific physics, but is the industry really asking for that? Uh, anyone feel free to jump in and comment. I was just typing a response. I was just typing oh, yeah. a response to that. So you, you guys got to it faster. So yes, absolutely. And, and it, it may be the nature of the kind of problems that have shown up on our doorstep. I've been working on an industrial project recently um, and in my experience, all district energy models or all district energy systems boil down to my load profile does not match my generation profile. Now, what do I do? Right. And so um, playing around with um, 
a lot of our a lot of our projects will end up with, you know, I, I've got an enormous amount of heat rejection when I don't want it, and I don't know what to do with it, right? And 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 mismatch between mismatch between even if you look on an annual basis, mismatch between I've got way more heat rejection than heat absorption. That that tends to be a big problem, especially in um, especially in in um, industrial situation. So yes, we, we are running into those things a lot and, and the ability to get down into the weeds, um, is, is really pretty crucial to, to what we're doing. We do very little on the, uh, load management side of things. So especially again, in, in industrial situations, uh, there's not much you can do to improve. Well, there's perhaps less you can do than in a than in a, a residential situation or or a uh, commercial building driven situation. Changing windows out isn't going to help um, when you know, you when you're talking about a an industrial process. The loads tend to be a little bit more um, cast in stone, if you will. Yeah, I would just to add real quick in the last minute. Um... Yeah, it really just depends, right? To Nathan's point before, um, is your building, is your plant uh, influenced substantially by a single load or a collection of loads that you're changing or not, right? You have a um, you know, massive university campus and you do a lighting upgrade in half the buildings that has less cooling and yeah, it might show up in the noise, right? If you're gonna add, add a 50 megawatt data center or supercomputer to that uh, facility, that's gonna show up. Right, that's still a load side issue. So again, it depends. Thanks, Fred and David. Um, I'm going to keep going. Uh, any hosts that want to stay on, any panelists? But uh, there's an interesting question here, and I tried to open it up so that it, I didn't realize that everybody listening could couldn't see all the questions. I think they might be able to see them now. I had a really interesting question. What about people coming into the workforce to handle these complex systems? Are you having problems finding people to hire? How can the academic world uh, possibly help prepare all of all, you know folks that are interested in in doing this work? Anybody, please feel free to comment. Mike Walters, thank you so much for adding your comments in in writing. Well, yeah, and I'll just briefly touch on that. I, I as part of being an adjunct faculty member at UW Madison, I sit on this uh, in a committee called the Professors of Practice. So it's basically people who are working, but also you know are adjunct faculty, and that group is constantly struggling, at least at UW Madison, with how much to influence the available coursework there to provide for more instruction on how to use tools and how to do specific things as opposed to, you know, sort of first principle engineering education that you, you, you typically would go through as a mechanical engineer. And, I, you know, I think the, the response I typed back was, look, it's, you know, the best thing you can do is, is embed that kind of requirement into a capstone course or, you know, encourage students to get internships at companies who are doing this kind of work. We've, we've, I mean, we, we do not uh, find it easy to find people who uh, know how to do this out of school and want to do this long-term, right? So it, those, those are two very difficult things to find in the same person. You'll find a, an entry-level engineer who will tolerate this for a period of time, but someone who really <laughs> wants to do this for five to seven years or for a career is a unique, a unique individual, and and so you know, I would I would certainly say there's lots that the academic world could do on this topic, but to really give give uh, you know students the sense of how complex these problems really are and how much space there is to add value through this kind of work is is you know fundamental kind of to drawing people towards this opportunity. I think we all kind of stumbled into it in our own unique paths, but, uh, you know, highlighting what's going on in the industry would be critical and maybe, you know, having a session like this inside of different uh, engineering schools and curriculum and just offering some more general education on what's going on in this space would be helpful to helping people, you know, self-educate a little bit more as well. I, th Sorry, I, guys, think I, have, I have to drop oh. off, but thanks for having me on the panel. I'll watch the rest of the recording later. Uh, Thank you, Fred. The audience is in good hands. So thanks, everybody.
I was I was going to mention I, I, following on on what Mike was saying. I, I think it's it's somewhat incumbent on practitioners out there to to provide some of this training. Right? There, there's a feedback loop. Uh, engineers coming through or 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 people coming through uh, university programs get training in something, and you know at the moment they've gone out into the workforce. They've had to learn, oh my gosh, district energy systems are really important. Uh, those people haven't then sort of filtered back to become, uh, apart from Mike, haven't then filtered back to sort of become professors in within the academic institutions who can then train a new, it, it, it's a slow, it's a slow feedback loop. Um, and so I see, I see there being a necessity of, of partnership uh, between academia and uh which which has a, a great deal of uh resources and industry which sort of has to react a little faster to what to changes in the market um it, i i think there's there's an incumbency upon upon those of us in the field uh who have sort of had to stumble our way through this and learn on the fly to to begin training the next the next group of people who will who will um, carry this torch on. Oh, carry the torch! Uh, great, Mr. Olympics. Um, and figure out what to do with the waste heat that's coming off the torch. <laughs> um, someone just asked, "How do you get in contact?" Here's my last slide. Here's everybody's contact info. We've got three more really interesting questions. Uh, I'm gonna keep going. Liam asks, has anyone encountered the time independent energy recovery, T-I-E-R, all electric central plant design yet? This sounds really interesting. I've never heard of this. Anyone on the panel? There's a I pulled the there. paper up, but I haven't read it yet. I'll just say that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Liam. Uh, okay, next question. Uh, Elizabeth asks, uh, specifically to Mike, I had asked a question about this, uh, and uh, there are a researcher at Georgia Tech, works closely with facilities managers. We are modeling campus district thermal systems still in the early stages, but we'll be interested to compare notes with other faculty that try to do that with their own facilities groups. So, uh, oh, actually clarification, that's from Scott Duncan from Georgia Tech, not Elizabeth, my bad. Sounds great, Scott. I would encourage Scott to reach out to me. We'd be happy to have a broader conversation there. Yeah, Scott awesome. also, um, we at NREL through Urban Opt have been working with uh, a couple of different universities that are looking at um, transitioning their existing STEAM district systems to, say, a fourth or fifth generation district system, uh, which is a complicated problem. And yeah, as we have a, a an in-process tool, it is not really ready for it, but we're happy to uh, toss around some ideas if that's interesting too. Awesome. Let's see here. Oh, it's just another comment about, uh, about uh, I think to Nathan. So you NREL gets all the attention. Everybody knows what NREL is doing. So uh, I don't think it's really a question. I think I actually do need to end this. Uh, my very kind host, Lori, has to host another Abipsa event in a few minutes. So. I just really want to thank everybody so much. We probably should have done two hours, but who wants a two hour webinar? So this is so interesting. Um, and who knows what might bubble out of this. So thank you so much for joining us. For folks on the YouTube, uh, please uh, please like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. You know, this is the Ibipsa USA makes content just like, you know, uh, all, all, the, all the cool Instagram people. So. And uh, if you need any specific uh, help with the BIPSA USA questions, there's a the admin at BIPSA 
link. And then of course you see everybody's contact info uh, on the main slide. I included Matthew Duffy. I didn't let Matthew Duffy join the talk. Sorry, Matthew, but uh, we, we that, that was my mistake typo. It should have taken his name off. But anyway, thank you everybody. Have a wonderful day. And uh, hopefully see you at Simbel next May. Okay. How do I end the webinar, Lori? Can you end it? <laughs>